Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Adventures in TV Writing. In honor of October being National Arts and Humanities Month, I am pleased to introduce Steve Harper, a TV writer, playwright, producer, and actor whose writing investigates how we navigate the world when invisible forces make themselves present. A native New Yorker, He's actually coming to us today from California. Steve has lived in Los Angeles since 2010 and is a co-executive producer of Tracker, an upcoming new series for CBS, CBS scheduled to premiere in 2024. Other TV writing includes uh, DC Stargirl, uh, CW Network, God Friended Me, CBS, Tell Me Your Secrets, Amazon Prime, American Crime, ABC, and Covert Affairs USA. So I'm not going to go into your entire background, Steve, but I thought, hey, as a background, <laughs> you've done so many things uh, in yeah. entertainment from acting to writing to producing a TV, stage, film, and plus you have your own coaching and consulting practice for writers, for actors. Can you fill me in a little bit on about your history. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, one of the things I say, I, I do a lot of things, of course, and I, I sometimes I say that and a Metro card will get me across town, you know, so. <laughs> so, uh, <You're> modest. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm super happy to be doing what I'm doing now. Like TV is a blast to create. And uh, I entered the entertainment industry as an actor. And that was, uh, that was originally my, uh, my go-to, my vision, my dream. And uh, and I ended up, um, you know, feeling like I wanted to create more stuff for me to do. I, I thought that the, the the roles that I was doing, I was interested in more different. Uh, and, and so I started writing, became a playwright and went to, you know, I went to drama school as an actor, then went to playwriting school. And when I first got an agent after playwriting school, one of the first things that the agent said to me was, are you interested in television? And you know, I've always been a television head. Like I grew up in a household where we just watched a ton of TV, and uh, and the uh, the idea of, you know, you can, you know, I love the work that I do as a playwright, but when you create something for television, millions of people see it, and there's nothing like that. You know, not only all across the United States, but all across the world, have seen and are seeing the things I've created for television. So it's like. It's a huge canvas for storytelling that I think on some level is is unparalleled and, you know, it's an amazing opportunity to to be one of the people who gets to do what I get to do for a living. Wow. Yeah. When millions of people see it kind of influences the culture. Yeah, right? I guess. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, it's interesting because I think there are some studies about how that works. And I don't know that we know exactly how that works, like how influential television is or you know i don't know that they can measure that necessarily but yeah i do think it's a it's you know lots of people are watching and there is a responsibility i think in and around that yeah so right now you're uh you're focusing on writing uh, a tv series can you tell us a little bit about that <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm on a show called Tracker, which is, uh, as you mentioned before, it's a new CBS drama. Uh, it's going to premiere after the Super Bowl. Uh, so February 11th, I believe that is on CBS. It's a show about a guy uh, named Coulter Shaw, who is, uh, he finds missing people and missing things. And it's based on a book. Uh, the book is called The Never Game. Uh, it's, a, it's the first in a series of books by uh, an author, a guy named Jeffrey Deaver. And so we've taken the, the first of those books uh, with permission from, from Mr. Deaver and turned it into this television series tracker. So, um, yeah, it's basically he goes around the country and uh, he finds rewards. He calls himself a rewardist, which, you know, is a term he made up. And, uh, you know, he answers, you know, he finds a, a reward or actually he works with these this, this lesbian couple who find him these, these rewards and they say, hey, Coulter, here's your next assignment. And he goes to wherever it is in the country and he tries to find a missing person or a missing thing and kind of solve the mystery of what that is. And usually there's some, you know, there's a chase at the end. So it's got a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of energy, a lot of action to it, as well as uh, a mystery at the beginning. 
Oh, wow. Yeah, I like uh, action sequences. They're fun. They yeah. add a little something to it. <laughs> they yes, must they be do. a joy to write. Yeah. Um, you have told me uh, that over the years, people have asked you, how can they be more creative? That's a big question, right? How, how do you respond to that question? Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of people out there, and I don't know whether, you know, these are the people who are watching now or in the future, but uh, there are a lot of people out there who don't, who think creativity is sort of relegated to specifically the arts, who feel like, like, unless I'm a painter or a dancer or an, a writer or a sculptor, I can't be creative. And I really subscribe to, I mean, I was raised, uh, as you said, in New York, born in Brooklyn, grew up on Long Island. My dad uh, is a visual artist. My dad uh, and my mom both have birthdays this month. So my father uh, actually turned 91 just uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but he's, you know, he's done painting and drawing and cartooning and collage and all sorts of things. Uh, and I think growing up in a household with him, what I realized is, and with my own art, um, that you can be creative in any number of ways. You know, how you dress yourself could be creative and how you make you know, the food that you make or how you shop or how you arrange and organize your house or you don't have to be writing poetry specifically in order to be, to lean into your own creativity. It's just about, you know, what's your mojo? What's your style? And and how do you bring that to bear? Uh, I think it's a personal decision, but it's something that where I think everybody on the planet is creative in one way or another, uh, whether they think of themselves or not, I think they can begin to think of themselves that way. Yeah. Now, I have I have another question that we didn't rehearse or anything, <laughs> so you could say no comment if you don't want to answer it. But I know that uh, in creative fields, anything Hollywood, film, TV, mm -hmm. uh, anything, dance, art, there's uh, they're very competitive and they're very hard to get into. There's a lot of rejection. Uh, how how do how do you cope with with that and move on and, and yeah you know get your foot in the door <laughs> it's it's a great question and there are, i think there are a lot of questions in that question um, yeah you know i think in terms of this whole space of rejection i do uh i definitely know what it feels like to have to put something forth and to have somebody say no thank you you know, whether it's me as an actor or me as a writer or something I've written or, you know, even on the show that I'm on now, I work with a number of writers. Uh, there are, you know, I am not, although I'm a co-executive producer of the show, I'm not the head writer or, you know, there are several, a couple of head writers. So I can put something out. Like just today, I turned in a document for our show, for, for an episode of our show. And all those people who are, you know, theoretically above me, they can say, yeah, we don't like this so much, or no, not this, you know, not this character name or not this sentence, or we don't like the sequence or, mm -hmm. so there's a lot of that. And I think on some level, you have to be prepared for lots of people's opinions. And I think the one of the ways you do that, for me anyway, is really to have a focus on, I think on some level, like what I'll call spiritual matters, you know, like it really helps to sort of look beyond myself and not just, it's, you know, not just show up with a huge ego and, and say like, you know, what I do is sacred and you can't criticize it or you can't, you know, it's really about being willing to collaborate and being willing to say, okay, well, yeah, let's go that way or let's try this or, uh, you know, those sorts of things I think are really helpful. Uh, and then, and then I also think to, to have, a life outside the work, you know, to to have family and friends and loved ones, to meditate, to exercise, to have other hobbies, you know, so that so that it's not like this work that I'm doing as much as I love it. It's not the end all be all. It's just it's one thing that I do. It doesn't represent everything. And, you know, so you learn to kind of cultivate both a thick skin and some sort of practice to kind of allow yourself to I think to move through the difficult times and all of the opinions that you're bound to encounter along the way. Yeah. And uh, that's what coming of age is all about is, you know, have hobbies, um, travel, do things that you love. Um, mm -hmm. You know, don't, you know, you're, you're not just your job. 
you know, and yeah. after yeah. after you stop working, you're you're not just what you did for a living. You can have, you know, you can engage in so many aspects of of life, positive aging. So another big question, how can people create a script on their own? Is that a possibility? Can it be done solo to write a play, a TV show pilot? Yes, you... 100%. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there, there's a certain amount of that that, you know, that uh, involves a little bit of technical expertise. I mean, you have to know about dramatic structure. You have to know about, you know, how do I create a character or how do I write good dialogue or, you know, what's the format for a play as opposed to a screenplay, as opposed to a, you know, television script or, you know, or a poem or a novel. Mm -hmm. So I think on some level, it it definitely pays for all of us to either study the form, whether it's on YouTube or in a class or, you know, reading a book, you can do all that. But then I think the fundamentals really about creating anything is really for me like a bite size, um, you know, step by step methodology. You know, I think there are lots of people who imagine for writers that you really need to write like six hours a day, eight hours a day, you know, I got to be Hemingway, I've got to, you know, show up the way he did, or, you know, name your famous writer person. But I don't really believe in that. What I believe in is like chipping away. So five minutes a day is good. If you want to start writing and sit down, set a timer for five minutes, you'll create something, you know, or 15 minutes or 10 minutes or 30 minutes, you know, find a way to create a habit, just like anything else that allows you to get into a groove and just begin to explore what's coming out of you. Like, what does it want to say? What do you want to say? What is it a story? Is it a memoir? Is it a, you know, I think that's the most important thing, I think, is to show up, is to find the discipline. And then all that other stuff, you know, the structure stuff, the all of that stuff, I think, can be learned. Yeah, and because there are different formats for different types of scripts, uh, then you can. I I would have asked you what are some of the steps you could take to to write the script from idea to finished script. But I, I would think because of the different formats, uh, there isn't one specific formula. There are lots of them. Yes, I do uh, think that in most cases, certainly with most dramatic things, with and with plays as well as TV. There is the notion that we know, like, you know, from when we were children, like there's beginning, middle and end. So that's basic dramatic structure is like what what stuff goes in the beginning, you know, like and what goes in the middle and what goes in the end. The middle is usually full of conflict, you know, so that's where the juicy stuff happens, where the, the character is like bouncing up against whatever they're bouncing up against. Uh, and that first part, that beginning is really the setup for whatever that action or that conflict piece is and the end is really you know where you sort of look toward the resolution where it's all going to sort of resolve in some way shape or form uh and so i think we all have to bring that sort of consciousness into our writing and say okay well i gotta ramp up i gotta get into the conflict and i gotta you know cool down so how do i do that you know and how many pages you know how many pages do i need to do that and i think that's obviously different in a 10 minute play than in a you know, than a in a five hundred page novel, but everything has that beginning, middle, and end to it. Yeah, I remember in high school creative writing, we learned that there has to be the crescendo, the 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 climax, and then you know, and then it goes down to the denouement, which was the <laughs> resolution. <laughs> yes, yes, yeah. Well, I think all of those terms yeah. are valuable and useful, and and it's also. You know, we can use that kind of terminology, but we can also just say, okay, what's my beginning? What's my middle? What's my end? And what yeah. feels right to me? I mean, that's one of the things that I think is really juicy about, you know, us as people. Like we live for stories, whether it's our neighbor telling us, oh my God, did you see what happened with the, you know, with the, the garbage man yesterday? Or whether it's, you know, watching television or a soap opera or a movie or reading a book, like we all have a sense on some level of what a good story is and feels like for us. So I think we're just reaching for that. Like what, what is the satisfying thing based on all the stories that I've heard, stories that I've told, the stories that I like? I think we know more than we think we know. Yeah, and as a writer and one of the producers is, uh, my question would be, how is a television show 
created, <laughs> accepted, and then run? And does it vary by production? Like you're in a production house or, or some yeah. such? I mean, everything, and I think, you know, everybody sort of understands this intuitively. Everything depends on who's running it. So, so mm -hmm. I'm going to give you like a basic structure of how it works, which is, I think, pretty much true all the time. And at the same time, everything depends on who's the head person in charge, like, you know, and because everybody will have their, their style about whether they run things gently or whether they want to do things fast or slow or how they assign things or what their personality or energy or the tone of the writer's room is. But essentially what we do is and it can be really fun is, you know, we'll come in, let's say there are, there are 10 of us, I think on the show that I'm on now, and we'll come in and the, the head writer, uh, you know, which we call in, in our business, the showrunner. And actually on our show, we have more than one, we have two showrunners. One of them will come in with an idea or will solicit ideas from us like overnight or the day before or whatever. And we'll come in and that person will say, okay, we're gonna do this story. Uh, let's say it's the wedding episode of whatever our series is. And so uh, that showrunner will have some ideas. You know, they'll say it's the wedding episode. You know, we want them to get married at the end, but then there's probably going to be, uh, we'd love to see a fight between the couple and maybe they won't get married. And there's this thing we need to service all these other characters that we have on a regular basis. Uh, and so we know these, you know, three, five, six, eight things and then as a group, we just start to brainstorm, you know, we'll say, oh, what happens if such and such or, oh, I can really imagine blah, blah, blah. There might be a scene where this happens that resonates with this character's backstory. And we just start throwing ideas in. We have a person in our writer's room who's not a writer, but is uh, is called the writer's assistant. Uh, and that person may or may not be a writer sort of in their normal life. But for us, they're basically like a court stenographer and they just type away. So everything that we say gets recorded by this person. So that person is uh, writing down every pitch, every suggestion, every idea, every nuance. And then at some point, the showrunner will say, great, I like these, you know, and usually we might be looking at a board either electronically or we might be in an actual room where we've written things on a big whiteboard. And the showrunner will say, great, I like these 20 things or these six things or these 10 things. And so we get rid of all the other things. And then we begin to build a story, an episode with those 10 things. So then the question becomes, okay, where, where do these things happen? What happens first? What, you know, go back to that beginning, middle and end kind of thing. Uh, and we just start again as a group. We just, it's almost like not exactly like, uh, you know, it's like an, an improv game where we're all suggesting, oh, that this scene could be really great here. And then maybe we could, you know, and we just start to build it together. And sometimes I think if we're, if you're doing well, if you're functioning well, that could take like a week or sometimes two weeks, depending on how difficult the story is. Um, so we just keep building and building. If it's a show like Tracker that's on a network, then we're very aware of the commercial breaks, you know, and, and every chunk before a commercial break, we call an act. So on Tracker, for example, we have a teaser and four acts. And that means that at the end of each one of those series of scenes, there's going to be some big cliffhanger because we want people to come back after the commercial break, you know. So we build the story. We try to put in these cliffhangers. We keep brainstorming, the showrunner will say yes or no and you know break all the ties that we have when we can't decide something. And then that writer, that showrunner will either go off and write, he'll be writing the episode, you know, he, he or she or they will be writing the episode themselves or they'll kick it to another writer. They'll say, Jeff, this is your episode. And then you go off and write, you know, a, there's a short story, a very short version called uh, the story area that is somewhere between one and three pages that gives uh, the powers that be, which in, in our case is the network, which is CBS, which will air our show. And then there's the studio, which is an entity that basically pays for the show. They're sort of the money people. And for us, the studio is 20th Century Fox Television and the network is CBS. So both of those entities get to chime in on what we do. So you would write like a three page story area. We'd send it to the studio and the network and they would comment and give notes. 
and then you change it. And then uh, when the showrunner's happy with it, then, and those entities are happy with it, you go off to outline. And then you're going to write another longer version, maybe now 10 pages or 15 pages that goes scene by scene. This happens, this happens. It's just like a short story version. Uh, and then after the studio and the network chime in on that, then, uh, and the showrunner's happy with it, and everybody's happy with it, then they're going to send you off to script. And you're going to take that 15 page outline and you're going to turn it into, say, a 45 page script. Uh, where you'll actually flesh out those scenes and you'll put in jokes and you'll put in character descriptions and scene descriptions and all that stuff. And then the same process, once you're done, you give it to the showrunner, he might, he or she might, they might tweak it and then send it to the studio and they'll give comments, send it to the network and they'll give comments. And when everybody signs off on it, uh, then it becomes a production draft and it goes to the director and the actors and the costumers and the set decorator people and all those people. And they start to do and collect and build all the things you need to make the episode that you wrote. Uh, that's essentially how it works. Yeah, well, I noticed that. Oh, do you have any? Do you have any uh, uh, episodes that you're at this point <laughs> writing uh, yes well just today uh we're um so our show tracker we had written a bunch of stuff before the writer's strike so we started actually working in january and and in may the wga went on strike as as i'm sure everybody knows uh and by that time we had written four scripts we had a outline for episode five. We had a story area for episode six. And we were currently working on episode seven, which we call breaking an episode. We, so we were breaking episode seven. Um, yeah, so when we came back just recently in the past couple of weeks, the network and studio have decided to go in a different direction with our show. So we've actually scrapped everything that we had created. Wow. January and May, yeah. And we're starting over. So, so the pilot has already been written and filmed. We've all seen it. It's fantastic. The second episode we rebroke in like a week, which is pretty amazing, and is being written now by uh, actually a group of writers. And uh, and I am uh, I'm basically the person in charge of the third episode. So just today, uh, based on this new idea that we sort of came up with overnight. Uh, I wrote my story area document just today and sent it off to, uh, once it was approved by my showrunners, it went off to the studio for them to approve it. So yeah, so that's, so we're working on that right now. Wow. So that was a chronological look through you know, how, how a yeah. series uh, uh, is done. And uh, you had mentioned uh, a little bit about the writer's strike. I guess you're really relieved uh, about uh, it ending and uh, I'm hoping you uh, you're you know satisfied with yeah. the outcome I am very satisfied with the outcome I feel like the uh, the negotiating committee for the, the the WJ did a tremendous job I'm very proud of them I'm very proud of the you know the Writers Guild is really known as one of the unions that that has traditionally really gotten good deals uh, for the kinds of strike actions we've done in the past. And I think this is no, uh, this is no change from that. This is like a really good deal. And, and the thing that I'm really proud of is, uh, and if you followed it closely, uh, or even if you didn't, every tier of writers got something, some improvement. So that's not only television writers, but also uh, feature film writers and comedy variety writers and soap writers and you know e everybody uh, got something that I think we can hold on to and be proud of. Now there are some people in the union who think that we should have gotten more. Or of course, you know, nothing's ever completely solved, and these contracts go for three years. So certainly three years down the line, there'll be more stuff to talk about and negotiate. But I'm super happy about it. Um, and, and I guess the one other thing I'll say too is uh, I am, uh, I've been very, it was very involved in the strike because I, for every television show, uh, there's a captain, there's like a person who is 
uh, basically the liaison between the union and each show. And so I'm the captain, the WJ captain for Striker, uh, Tracker, I mean to say, which is our show. And uh, and I and for those ten writers plus twenty other writers, I was assigned by the union. I was communicating every week to those people about how the strike was going. I was out on the picket line three days a week. I was helping managing the helping manage the um, the picket location that I'm closest to, which is Culver Studios, which is where Amazon is is housed. So I was out there a lot and very involved. Uh, so the fact that it's over is a big relief for me because um, I was doing a lot in that space. Wow, I haven't been following it, but I know the the actors are still on strike. Yes, the actors yeah. are still on strike. They are either hitting or about to hit day 100 of them being out there. Uh, I'm also part of that union, so I'm watching that very closely. And uh, unfortunately, because of the work that I'm doing uh, on our show, I'm not able to go out there and pick it with them, but I'm I'm absolutely with them in, in spirit. And And the other thing is like, we can't do anything as TV writers without the actors. So we're writing stuff, but you know, we can't film anything, obviously, until the, the SAG AFTRA, SAG AFTRA and the AMPTP have settled because we need actors to to do our stuff, to say our words and all that. Well, that's interesting. And you know who they are they're already been cast. Most yes, of them, the, I guess. <laughs> yes. The 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 leads of our show, there are four four regular characters, and those people have all been cast. Uh, of course, every episode, because our character goes different places in the country, uh, will always have guest actors, and we don't know who those people are. But uh, yeah, the main characters, the main actors, they know who they are. Yeah. So, um, you, uh, what are some of the biggest misconceptions about uh, writing and acting <laughs> that you've come across? How oh, biggest misconceptions? I think one thing that came up a lot during the writer strike, uh, certainly the AMPTP, uh, which is the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, as they were pushing back at WGA writers. One of the biggest myths that they were trying to push is that we're all millionaires. You know, we're all we're all like you know we're all J.J. Abrams or Damon Lindelof mm -hmm. or you know you know name your famous showrunner writer. But that's not true. There are a lot of us who are you know middle class uh, middle class writers. And and I think one of the things that you know the strike was so good for is that you know with the and we could talk more about it, but with the sort of shrinking of, I mean, you think about it, there's lots of television these days, um, but the bread and butter for TV writers is the kind of show or has been the kind of show that I'm on, which is like a big show on a network that has a lot of episodes that lasts for a long time that go eventually will go into syndication or, you know, the, the, there are all these tiers of uh, for, for the traditional shows goes into syndication it goes it gets sold to american airlines dvds come out it gets you know it gets uh it'll end up on cable or whatever and each one of those for a middle class writer gets a, a residual so there's a payday every time that happens they reran my episode i got a check you know uh and so with streaming you can just imagine the difference between being on a show that has 22 episodes which most network shows do and a show and a show that has like six episodes you know and and where where a lot of those streaming shows almost all of them they go to that streaming outlet and they just stay there right there's no no american airlines no dvds no syndication no foreign set like it's just it just goes to that one place so uh, anyway, so this was the thing, like the the misconception was that we were all wealthy, but really there are a lot of people who are living paycheck to paycheck based on residuals and working regularly. And if they can't work as much or don't or work as often or get as many residual payments, then it becomes really hard to make a living doing what I do. So that's that's one of those misconceptions. Yeah. And the union wasn't paying everyone's salary when they were striking right they no you were I mean, yeah there's there's a you know there there was a strike fund that you could apply for if you were mm -hmm. 
dealing with financial hardship and you could say, you know, here's what I need and how, and then a, a committee of people on the other side would look at those applications and see what they could do. But those, those things were limited and yeah, it was a really, really stressful time for, for a lot of writers uh, who, you know, whatever, had to get other jobs or, uh, you know, sold their homes, moved away, all sorts of things happened to writers I know during that period. Wow. Well, moving back earlier, uh, not in your career, it could have been uh, pretty recent, but what was that uh, you've been involved in pitching uh, shows. Yes. And uh, what is it like to, uh, to, to pitch uh, ideas for a brand new program? What's that process like? Yeah, and what are that... the odds <laughs> of, of being accepted? <laughs> yeah, the odds are slim. Uh, I couldn't really tell you statistically and get that accurate. But um, it's challenging because if you think about it, you know, if you think about your favorite show, Whatever your favorite show is, if you have one, you've built this relationship with it over years and years, hopefully, you know, if the show's been around that long. And you know all these ins and outs and nuances of all these characters and these storylines and, you know, whatever the adventures are. And there's a certain place that that lives in your heart. So just imagine, if you would, that you're giving birth to that show and you've got all of those thoughts about those characters and those circumstances, but nobody else has seen it yet. You know, it's kind of like, if you were to land on Mars and have to explain uh, every episode of Cheers or what Cheers is like to people who don't know what Cheers is or was, that's the challenge of pitching. Because you really have to give the the buyer, the studio, or and the network this this visceral sense of who are the people and what do they do and what are they like and what are their personalities and you know how does the show what's the tone of the show and the energy of the show and you know how would you make a hundred episodes of it and how does it you know how does it work and you know what other shows is it like and where might it go on the schedule and who might appreciate it who's the audience all of those things you, know, you get you basically get like 20 minutes to convey a wealth of information about something that people can't sort of hold in their hands. Uh, so it, it's tricky, uh, but, you have, but you managed to do it. We managed to do it with good storytelling, maybe a you know PowerPoint or pitch deck that we have. If it's in person, we might bring props. You know, we might sort of hold up like, you know, here's the world and, you know, it's a sci-fi show. And so just imagine, you know, you sort of do all sorts of things. You might bring in pictures or big charts, or you might show a little, a little uh, clip of something or any number of things. Uh, so it's, it's a, it's a challenge. And yet it can be really exciting to figure out how do I get people to imagine this thing uh, when they've never seen it and it's only existed in my brain. And those people are executives. Yes. And... So, yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So these people are in the world of television, in the world of uh, both networks and studios. There are there are a lot of different types of people, but essentially on the on the buying end, the people you're pitching to, there are development executives. And there are current executives. So the development executives are trying to develop brand new shows and learn about brand new writers and like, oh, what's the next thing that we can bring to our network or our streaming service? And the current people are people who are helping manage the current programming, right? So they're sort of hand, handling all the things that are, are on the air already. So it's actually very interesting because right now, because Tracker is a brand new show, we are working with and getting notes and feedback from both development executives who are sort of handing off to current executives. So whereas maybe by the end of the season or by next season, if we get a next season, there'll be fewer people to you know vet our material. Right now, there's a whole army of people who have a vested interest in how does this show work and are we fulfilling the promise of it and what do we need and you know. So it's a lot, a lot of voices as the development folks hand off to the current programming folks. Yeah, and you've you have been involved in series that are so 
there's such different types of stories. You have <laughs> Star Girl, a, a superhero. God friended me. Tell me your secrets. American crime, covert affairs. They're all. How do you shift gears uh, on yeah. on these? <laughs> That's a good question. I mean, I think I think the answer is for me. I mean, I don't know if this will sound too woo woo, but I think it's always about plugging into what I'm interested in. Like plugging into for me, I'm always interested in character and human behavior. And I'm always wondering, like, how is it that this character ends up doing this thing? Like, what does he or she or they think about, you know, why are they doing that? And why, how do they get there? And how do they justify it? And, you know, and so I'm always asking those same questions, whether we're talking about, you know, Blue Valley, which is the, you know, fictional town where Stargirl takes place, you know, or whether we're in a grittier world of American crime, I'm always looking at what's the motivation of this character and how do I, you know, because if I'm going to write it on the page from the point of view, and this this for me is where my acting really comes into play, uh, because having played so many parts and having allowed my brain and heart to sort of melt into so many different kinds of people, I, that's essentially what I'm doing when I'm writing scenes, you know, I'm trying to embody this, you know, whatever, this super villain, and at the same time, in the same scene, this superhero, you know, or this, you know, in the case of Tell Me Your Secrets, this suspected serial killer, you know, or in the case of American Crime, you know, this, uh, this social worker or, uh, or this spy in covert affairs. So I'm just trying to allow myself to get into their headspace and understand how they're traveling the journey that they're traveling right and making it seem believable yeah though you know that it's <laughs> even yes. if it's fiction yeah yes and, and part of part of what's useful about that too is once you're on, on set as a writer the actors i mean they're obviously gonna work through the director because the director that's the director's primary job is to work with the actors and set up the scenes and all of that stuff and orchestrate everything that the crew is doing but occasionally an actor might or and the director might turn to the writer and say what did you guys mean by this like how is that how is this possible you know so to be there to fill in those gaps and to say oh this is what we meant or this is what this thing is foreshadowing the future or uh, you know, that becomes really useful. So if we haven't thought it out, you never want to have an actor say, what's the deal with this line and go, well, I don't know. Uh, we just threw that in there. That wouldn't be a good response. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it throughout your career, how much has luck played a part mm. and how much has skill? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a really good question. I think, especially in a forum like this. So, um, you know, I, given the fact that I had done, I had had another career, a whole career as an actor, uh, and, and also, you know, was doing playwriting before TV, by the time I got to Los Angeles, you know, I was, I was in my forties, you know, and I remember going to, I've got a couple of very successful college friends and I remember going to one of them who's, uh, you know, pretty successful writer. He and his wife are a writing partnership and they ran Grey's Anatomy for a while and they're like really amazing folks. Uh, but in any case, I asked him, I said, am I too old for this? You know, because I felt like, you know, ageism exists certainly in Hollywood. And I wanted to know whether or not it was a liability for me to show up at my, you know, advanced age and be uh, looking for TV work. And he said the most interesting thing, which I think is really relevant. He said, and I say this to people all the time. He said, look, as a showrunner, I'm going to have the opportunity to, uh, TV is a very hierarchical game, I should say. So there's, you know, the lowest level of TV writer is called the staff writer. And oddly enough, it's the only level that has the word writer in it. Uh, so so all of the, the hierarchy goes staff writer, story editor, executive story editor, uh, co-producer, producer, supervising producer, uh, co-executive producer, executive producer. So this is a very long hierarchy. So my friend said to me, if I'm going to hire somebody as a staff writer, as the entry level person, and I'm going to choose between some 22 year old 
who maybe just got out of college, has very little life experience, very little professional experience, uh, maybe very little, you know, writing experience, or I'm going to hire you who's got life experience and, you know, a wealth of stories and has written for years and knows the theater and knows actors and has directed. He was like, you are a bargain, you know, for the same price than to hire somebody who perhaps would bring less to the table. So I think there's always luck involved. And at the same time, I think there is this kind of energy of what we bring as older people to, you know, to a workplace like this, where, you know, there's maturity and there's imagination and there's experience that I have in my writer's room that perhaps some of the younger writers don't have, you know, and I think that that, that can make a huge difference. Um, there's definitely luck though. I'm not going to say there isn't luck a lot. You know, it has to do, I think television is, like so many things is really about networking. It's about how we keep in touch with people and who knows us and who knows that we're out there, who knows that we're doing things, you know, who who's aware of us. And so, you know, I have an agent, I work with an agent, I work with a manager. I got those people very early on in my career coming out of uh, playwriting school. And, uh, and I'm represented by the same companies that I was, you know, early on. Uh, and those people have helped vouch for me and recommend me to other people. And over the years, I've met so many people. You know, in fact, there's a woman who's an executive, who's a CBS executive on the show, on Tracker, on the show that I'm on now, who I met years ago, like just in a general meeting. And I've known her for probably five, six, seven years. There's another executive who... Uh, you know, when I worked on God Friended Me, which was also a CBS show, I met him there and he knows me from that. So there's a lot of those kinds of things in the world of television where uh, it's it's about, it can be about who you know and who trusts you to, you know, come up with ideas and to write things and, you know, and so, so yeah, so, so luck for sure, networking for sure. And I do think experience counts as well. Well, you know, one thing I'll say, um, I was talking about the difference between the the network space and the the streaming space. Um, you know, Covert Affairs, which was my first show, was on the USA Network, which was cable, and we had, uh, if I'm not mistaken, we had thirteen episodes of Covert Affairs. I think I think that's what we did, mm -hmm. and um, or we might have had sixteen. Anyway, we had something in the teens. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not remembering exactly now, but, um, you know, so that was one kind of way to pace myself, you know, because as a group, we're all trying to, you know, as a group, we're trying to get to the end of those episodes and feel like we've created a good season of television. We have enough stories to fill that space. And so that's a certain kind of something you get used to, you know, then when I was on American Crime, which was a network show, it was a network show that had very few episodes. So we had, I think, eight episodes, you know, on a network show. So that was a different kind of pace, right? Different kind of period of time, different kind of energy, because, you know, based literally half the number of episodes is the previous job. Uh, you know, Tell Me Your Secrets was 10 episodes, you know, so again, a different kind of pace. And then when I got to God Friended Me, God Friended Me had... Uh, 22 episodes, which most network shows do have. So that felt like a real marathon in terms of being able to pace yourself, come up with enough stories to, you know, I remember literally getting to the middle of the season of God Friended Me, which was, you know, episode 11, and feeling like, emotionally like, wait, aren't we done with this? Like, this would be a whole season on, you know, on uh, Tell Me Your Secrets or something else, you know? And so I, suddenly now we've got to create 11 more of these. It seemed kind of impossible. Uh, so I think you learn to sort of just, you know, figure out how to pace yourself, the number of episodes you're supposed to write. So with eight, you kind of have the luxury of imagining more, you know, you know, taking the time to, uh, to craft it uh, you know, without haste, things like that. Whereas, you know, when it gets to be 11 or 15 or 22. <laughs> yeah. It's, I mean, the other thing quicker. too, 
Yeah, the other yeah. thing too about most network shows is that network shows, uh, we get a point on a network show where we have written episodes and they start filming episodes. So you, there's a lot you learn when they're filming episodes and you're still writing. For example, let's say you put these two characters in a romantic relationship and you find out, oh my goodness, these two characters are not gelling as a couple. We need to write new stuff so that maybe by the end of the season, they're not a couple, right? Or or this character who we put in as, as a, you know, sort of a guest character really pops and the network loves seeing the dailies of this person. We're going to write more episodes with this person before we, you know, you don't learn those things if you're working on a show where you write all the episodes and they're not filming because you don't get, there's nothing to test. There's nothing to find out until much later. So that's also an interesting thing to deal with when you're working on a show where they're shooting while you're writing. Yeah, we have a question from Susan and no, it wasn't already answered. We, we did touch upon something similar, but can someone send in jokes or ideas to a show or to you? <laughs> uh, yeah, no. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I think there are two answers to this. One is that as a, you know, as a writing coach, and a lot of people do that kind of writing coaching thing that I do, um, you know, I am committed, as lots of other writing coaches and teachers are, to helping writers expand their own expertise. So in the space of, hey, here's my brand new idea that I've never done before that I'm trying to turn into a pilot, or I'm trying to recognize whether or not this is a thing that I want to pitch to a network or whatever, you know, there are sort of those I guess I would call it kind of like academic or sort of isolated spaces that are about your work. However, that having been said, for if if a writer is on a show, you know, me on Tracker or me, let's say I was on a show like Law and Order or something that was well established, it's actually in our contract that we are not allowed to take pitches from people about episodes of the show that we're on. And you can imagine that's because it's a it's an easy way for the network, say, to get sued if, you know, I if I'm talking to you and you're like, here's here's an episode idea for Law and Order. And I'm like, uh, I'm not supposed to listen, but I will. And then, you know, five months later, that's on the air. You know, you could sue NBC and I would get in trouble. And, you know, so we so it's not possible to send ideas for a show that I'm on to me or that somebody else is on. You can't do that, but you can certainly develop your own stuff and perhaps get the assistance of a professional to help you develop your own stuff. That's not related to any show that that writer is on. If that makes sense. Yeah. That's interesting because someone could say, Hey, that was my idea. <laughs> right. And then what do you do? Yeah. And it's copyright. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, I know this isn't about TV, but uh, you have written a book of plays. I have uh, written a book of uh, plays. Let me see if I can hold it up. I have a background, so it might not, it might not show up. Yeah, too we, well. can, we can see it. We can see the top of it actually. If you, yeah, yes, a few short plays to save the world uh, by Laughing Panda Press. Yes, that's my uh, that's yeah. my collection of short plays, which I'm very proud of. Um, you know, I, I started in playwriting school and beyond writing 10 minute plays, 10 minute, 15 minute plays. And there are lots of 10 minute play festivals all around the country and the world. Uh, and, you know, some of these pieces have been produced in New York and uh, just all over the place. And so I wanted to put together a collection of my favorite of the short plays. And uh, yeah, that's uh it sort of it came out a couple of years ago. You can find it on Amazon and you know Bookshop and uh, BarnesandNoble.com. Uh, it's pretty fun. Yeah. What? So you didn't write it from scratch. These were plays that have actually been uh, been produced. A lot of them. Yes, uh, most yeah. of them have been produced. Yeah, mm -hmm. and you know the collection is called "A Few Short Plays to Save the World," and I remember being on a plane. I don't know how long ago, five or six years ago, thinking, oh, I do eventually want to publish this collection of my short plays. I decided that the title, A Few Short Plays to Save the World, would be a good title for a collection of short plays. And I thought to myself, 
I should write a play called A Few Short Plays to Save the World that I could put in that collection. And I did that. So one of the plays in the collection is named that. Uh, so it's a little, little bit meta. Uh, yeah, I think there are 17 original short pieces in there and they have been done uh, quite a few places. Do they have a similar theme or genre amongst all of them? Is there some thread running through all of them or do they stand alone? <laughs> Not really. I think they pretty much stand alone. I mean, I will tell you, you know, when you talk a little bit about uh, networking, not a whole lot, but you know, one of the networking techniques that I've learned is the way to talk about myself in Hollywood, uh, to let people know what kind of writer I am. So I do feel like these, this collection sort of uh, fits very well within the umbrella of stuff that I write. And so here's how I describe myself to people who haven't met me as a writer. Uh, and hopefully this will make sense to you and 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 all the people listening. Uh, you know, I say my father is a major Catholic, believes in the books of the church. My mother believes in the books of the horror section of the bookstore. So I would come home from Catholic school and I'd be like, mom, what's happening in Salem's lot? You know, consequently, I write about what I call the invisible things. So sometimes that involves... Uh, literally ghosts or spirits. Sometimes it involves things I think people aren't talking about, like race or sexuality or politics or religion. Uh, and all of my work uh, sort of revolves around those kinds of themes. And I think the, the, uh, the, the plays in this collection are definitely sort of in that universe of those sorts of subjects. I know that uh... As a writer, you get to see others interpreting your work. <laughs> Maybe you've seen it done well the way you would want to see or imagine it, but other times maybe it falls on its head. W yes. What is it like to see <laughs> <laughs> yes. people well, interpreting your work? Yeah, you know, I mean, one of my analogies, and you know, this is not it's not the perfect analogy, and I and I'm not a biological parent. I, you know, I have uh I have stepkids and grandkids and stuff, but not not biologically. But I would imagine if you had a child, uh, perhaps a small child, and that child had, you had decided the child had an aesthetic, like, you know, she loves to wear burgundy and she really likes to have a bow in her hair and that sort of thing. And you saw somebody else, like, say, at whatever, kindergarten or somebody, some other person, dress your child in a way that you didn't imagine like oh no she's wearing blue and she there's no book right it's a little bit like that when you see somebody take like, something that you created literally like a play and they don't exactly do it the way you imagine it's there's there's a weird sort of disconnect like oh that's not mm, that's not how it was designed or that's not how i've seen that thing in the past uh and you know again depending on when that happens you can either intervene if it's in re rehearsal stage or you just have to let it go. You just have to be like, okay, she's wearing blue. Can't do anything about it. Wow. And have you acted or directed in any of the shows you've written? Um, I have. I have. Not, uh, not a whole lot, not as much as I would like. But I've certainly, um, you know, one of the things I created was a web series uh, several years ago in 2016. We actually got nominated for an Emmy. It's called Send Me, and it's it's on YouTube. So if you put in Send Me YouTube, uh, and I'm in that, and I wrote that and produced that. Uh, I've also um, been working on a solo show, a one-person play that I've had several readings of that I'm in. And uh, so occasionally I've done that. Uh, and it can be fun. It can be super daunting as well. Wow. One person shows are amazing. <laughs> you <laughs> you play all the parts or just one part. And uh, gosh, yeah. if I wrote one, I don't know if I could memorize everything <laughs> that I wrote. I've written songs that I don't, yeah. sometimes don't remember the lyrics while I'm performing. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, you know, you have the technique down. You've been doing this for years. Yeah. Um. So, w what is, I guess, in the few moments we have left, what's next for you? What's the most important thing you want to concentrate on in the months ahead? 
Yeah. Maybe well, the beyond. Thing I, <laughs> the thing I'm really excited about is Tracker. You know, I'm really, uh, I have been on one other brand new show and that was Tell Me Your Secrets, which, you know, is a very strange, if you haven't seen it, uh, it's a very strange uh, sort of female centered serial killer drama on that's on Amazon that we wrote actually for TNT. Uh, but I'm curious to see, I have not been on a brand new network show ever. So I'm really excited to see how, not only how we develop and continue writing Tracker, but also how people respond to it. I'm really looking forward to finally having an audience when February comes around and seeing how both critics and regular people uh, respond to this character, this circumstance and the scripts that we're creating. This is your first new one, but the ones that you uh, did previously, they were already in existence, so they could take on another writer, perhaps? Yes, exactly. I mean, this yeah. is the first new network show I've been on, as uh -huh, opposed uh -huh. to a brand new uh, streaming show, uh, which, you know, it's just is different. So it'll be interesting to see how people respond to it. Also, you know, we've got the the great good fortune of, of coming on right after the Super Bowl. So lots of people will see this. And, you know, hopefully they like it and the show's around for a long time, but we were rolling the dice just like every other project. And who knows? Excellent. This was a really wonderful hour with you. Uh, really we fun, really, yeah. we you. really filled that hour. And <laughs> Renee said uh, that uh, listening to you has been informative and delightful. Thank you All for right. sharing your knowledge and experience, which, which I echo. Uh, better than watching old episodes of Dick Van Dyke, still one of my favorite shows. Oh, uh, so with that, let me say thank you. Thank you once again. This thank is you. really wonderful. Yeah, it's been really <laughs> fun. Thanks so much for having me. All right. Have a good night, everybody.